Bonjour, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Zach Ayish. I'm a developer advocate uh, with the FVM team at Protocol Labs. And uh, thanks for the introduction, Robert. Always flattering. And uh, thanks to the previous speakers for laying down the foundation of what Filecoin is, literally. Um, and yeah, so um, I'm a, actually a self-taught uh, software engineer. I studied mechanical engineering in school and kind of fell in love with the tech and with Web3. So now I just have a passion and love for teaching other people how to program and uh, seeing them go along the same journey I went through. Uh, it's very rewarding. Um, yeah, so that's why I'm here. Uh, excited to give a talk on a boat for the first time. I can check that off my bucket list. Uh, so with that said, uh, let's dive in. I'm gonna talk about the Filecoin virtual machine and how you can develop on it and like uh, develop cool new applications like uh, data DAOs. So uh, you've probably heard a bit about this uh, throughout the week, but just a quick recap, the Filecoin master plan. Um, step one, you know, build the world's largest decentralized storage network. We got that checked off. Exabytes of storage is committed to the network. Uh, onboard and safeguard humanity's data. Uh, this is gonna be always an ongoing process, right? There's always gonna be more data to onboard. Uh, so I figure this is gonna be an upward slope uh, till the end of time. And uh, step three is bring compute uh, to the data to enable web scale apps, right? And this is kind of where the Filecoin virtual machine uh, starts coming into play. So the Filecoin virtual machine uh, delivers on-chain programmability to the Filecoin network. Um, and we're gonna talk exactly what that means. There's some misconceptions um, about where in the stack the FVM sits. So if we look at this diagram here, um, it kind of outlines the architecture of the Filecoin virtual machine. Um, you know, at the bottom uh, of this diagram, we have the Filecoin node. Uh, this is uh, one of the most popular node implementations is the Lotus node. And this is what all the storage providers run, right? And within that Filecoin node is the Filecoin virtual machine, right? So it's not like this extra layer, this other program that storage providers need to run. Uh, every storage provider, everyone who's running a, a Lotus node is running the Filecoin virtual machine, right? And uh, it was actually designed um, with the interpreter Wasm time, right? So it runs WebAssembly code, but on top of that Wasm time interpreter uh, is a virtualized Ethereum virtual machine, right? And uh, you may be familiar with the EVM. It is the most popular runtime uh, currently in the Web3 space, which is one of the main reasons it was chosen. Uh, but it is still early days in Web3, right? And it's unclear whether uh, EVM will be the main uh, runtime in the future or uh, some new chain, right? Like, you know, Solana was, uh, VM was seeing some growth. We had Move for a while. They're still growing. Um, so the FVM was developed from the ground up to be extensible, right? Other runtimes can be put on top of that. Um, and um, we're gonna get there in the future projects, but um, Wasm, native Wasm code in the future will also be able to run uh, at a much faster speed, which will allow developers to develop uh, smart contracts in whatever language they like that can, compos uh, that can compile to Wasm, right? So, so many major languages can compile to Wasm. You have Java, C Sharp, um, JavaScript. Uh, many languages can compile, right? So there's definitely an advantage to having a WASM-based uh, virtual machine, right? A uh, quick overview on some uh, future projects uh, that FBM is kind of enabling, and we'll kind of go into more detail on some of these later. But we have renewal uh, as a service, right? So deals on Filecoin uh, have a certain amount of time that they can last until they expire, and um, uh, renewing as a service, uh, the FEM allows external actors to come in, monitor the state of the deals, and uh, renew them in perpetuity, right? So now you can have uh, more uh, permanent storage uh, without having to monitor it, having a centralized actor monitor it all the time. Um, interplanetary consensus subnets, um, this has been talked about a little bit throughout the event, um, but this is how Filecoin plans on scaling the state of Filecoin, right? Um, it allows developers to spin up subnet chains that connect into Filecoin and they can choose the security properties that they want. 
And um, this will be big as more performant-focused applications want to come on board into the Filecoin ecosystem. Uh, I mentioned earlier native user-defined WASM actors. Uh, because the EVM is actually virtualized on top of the uh, FVM, um, native WASM actors will be a lot more performant, right? You don't have this virtualization overhead on top. Um, and uh, these last two points, uh, these are kind of even farther out in the future, you know, depending on how things evolve in the landscape. But uh, new foreign blockchain runtimes could be added, as well as uh, no, uh, new foreign non-blockchain runtimes, such as I don't know, example, the, uh, F, um, the uh, JVM, Java Virtual Machine. Why? Who knows? A lot of people like Java. Enterprises love Java. Just an idea. Right, so I'm um, going to address the architecture a little bit more because I always see a lot of misconceptions uh, with developers. Um, IPFS is actually uh, a separate protocol network from Filecoin, right? Um, they're built on a lot of uh, the similar technologies like content addressing, IPLD data structures, um, but IPFS is separate and it gives um, no guarantees that your data will be persisted, right? That's what Filecoin is for, right? Um, so these are actually two distinct you know, networks of computers. Um, so then when we go up and look at the Filecoin uh, structure, you have layer zero, the Filecoin storage layer. This is the storage providers themselves. Those are the people running the nodes that we, I was talking about earlier. Uh, you have la layer one. I call it, call it a layer 0.5, because um, this is within those nodes again. Uh, but you have the FVM, uh, Filecoin virtual machine, that allows you to run computations over state in Filecoin. Uh, and this is different from running computation over the data stored with storage providers, right? Um, and then layer two, we have storage related dApps and solutions um, that can be built on the FEM. So again, uh, you know, here's IPFS, just like a little quick diagram. You know, a client can run their own nodes on IPFS. Uh, they can run nodes with a community to keep data pinned. They can uh, pay for a pinning service like Pinata. But either way, you're not getting very strong guarantees that your data will stay there or you're relying on a centralized intermediary uh, to give you those guarantees. Right? So um, on Filecoin, uh, you can think of the blockchain as acting as an intermediary between, a decentralized intermediary between um, clients who want their data stored permanently and storage providers um, who are willing to take on these storage deals and store that data, right? Um, this is a very important distinction because, again, a lot of people think that computation in the FEM uh, happens directly with um, the storage providers and the data stored with them. It does not. It works on the state of the blockchain, so that middle layer there. And we'll talk about what exactly that means and what that looks like to developers. Um, but like, if you wanted to run computation with the data stored in the storage providers, you'd use a solution like Bacalao or Lilypad. Um, which is, we have uh, Ali right here who is a representative of that team. So um, a lot of synergy between these two projects. Um, so yeah, um, the Filecoin FVM is built inside of that chain that you see there. And we've already been through this slide. Yeah, and so the EVM was choosen, chosen again as the first runtime uh, that's actually available for users to interact with because of its popularity and all the tools and ecosystem that has popped up around it. If you've been in the Web3 space at all, uh, you probably interacted with like MetaMask, right? And MetaMask connects right out of the box to the FVM. You have tools like Hardhat, you have tools like Foundry, um, Chainless, all these like standard things. Um, so this allows developers to easily port their apps, and if you're already familiar with Solidity, you can get developing like that. So, next com most common question is, why should I use the FEM, right? Uh, there's a bunch of EVM chains out there. Um, you know, it makes sense. Like, why, what's the differentiating factor with the FEM versus uh, every other EVM compatible chain? And the answer is quite simple. This concept of storage deals, right? 
remember, Filecoin was tailor-made for um, storage, storing humanity's data. And uh, this concept of like large data storage does not exist on any other uh, EVM compatible chain out there, right? So you can uh, write logic around these deals to create cool apps or dApps, decentralized applications, like data DAOs to manage the data that's getting stored and data can be crowdfunded and we're actually gonna go through a simple example of that in a bit. Um, so what is a storage deal? Um, just to be clear, again, not the actual data that's stored with the storage provider, but the metadata or the contract that represents that data that's being stored with the storage providers, right? So you have a bunch of like common fields. You have the deal ID, the identifier for that deal, um, the time it was created, the address of the client who created it, uh, the provider, um, the size of the data or the piece size. Um, is the deal verified on Phil Plus? Uh, many deals are verified with uh, Phil Plus, so that's definitely a program you're gonna wanna check out uh, if you wanna actually make deals. But um, yeah, so what isn't a storage deal? Again, uh, I think this is the last time I'm gonna repeat this, but it is not the actual data stored uh, with the storage providers. It is essentially the contracts that um, represent the deals that the storage providers must provide proofs to, uh, else they get slashed, right? So it provides crypto economic security for the actual persistence of the data. So uh, we have this concept of storage deals, which has existed since the beginning of Filecoin, and we have uh, the Solidity EVM uh, runtime. How do we connect the two? Uh, well, we work together with uh, a great team of developers uh, at a company called Zondax uh, to create Filecoin.sol or the Filecoin Solidity libraries. And these act as an interface between the traditional Filecoin APIs and those getting those storage deals into your smart contracts and the Solidity world, right? And since I have GitHub open, I'm already opened to uh, the page here. And we can kind of click on contracts here under the Zondax uh, Filecoin Solidity. And this is currently in the progress of being moved into the Filecoin project GitHub. But you'll see a bunch of Solidity files here. Um, these represent what we call uh, inbuilt actors or you can think of them like Ethereum precompiles if you use the Ethereum world. This is logic that's pre-built in uh, from the old APIs in Filecoin. And these are the interfaces in Solidity world, right? So I'll click on market API. There's a bunch of methods here uh, that we can call in Solidity to get and set a bunch of different information on deals. I actually have a, uh, some code in Remix running right now. Uh, you know, Remix is a very popular IDE for getting started in development in uh, Solidity world. And this is a simple Gitter contract that just imports that market API. You'll see that at the top and um, calls a bunch of getter methods and stores them uh, in um, these uh, state variables over here in the top, right? And this is just to show like, hey, this is how you can quickly get deal information in. Any deal that exists on the Filecoin blockchain can be retrieved this way. Um, you just provide a deal ID in for each of these methods and you can write logic around deals, right? Um, so, uh, if you want to make a storage deal now, you've probably been hearing a lot about uh, different ways to make them. I'm going to go through three primary ways that we're kind of recommending people think about making deals, right? Uh, so, uh, one way is you don't need programmatic storage, right? You just you have some large data set, you just need to make one deal one time. Uh, you can still go the traditional route, right? And make uh, storage deals through the normal Filecoin APIs. Um, it can be quite complicated of a step. You know, you need to make um, relationships with SPs and make a proposal that's fair between both of you, sign that proposal, and they can post that to make a deal, right? Now, you may want to use the EVM to make storage deals, right? And um, if you are storing data less than four gigabytes, like small NFT images once or twice, you actually, uh, 
may want to use what we call an aggregator, like web3.storage or nft.storage. And these are being uh, developed to actually be called from the uh, FVM. And finally, storing large data. Um, there's actually a contract called the client contract. Um, I have it here in Remix. And it's just an import right now. But um, for time's sake, I'll just kind of get through this. But like, uh, we have the client contract. And that just emits an event. And you can make deals uh, straight from the FVM with storage providers. Usually, these have to be larger deals to incentivize uh, storage providers to actually pick them up. Right, so what problems can the FVM solve? Uh, we can create governance around storage, uh, tokenomics around uh, what we want to store. For instance, this concept of data DAOs, endowment management, uh, these renewal workers that I've talked about, all kinds of fun things, right? So this concept of data DAO that I keep bringing up is the concept of using a DAO to manage data stored on the Filecoin network, right? So my colleague Sarah came up with this fun idea, Biscuit Data DAO. You know, everyone knows Biscuit the Corgi. This is the, the mascot of the Filecoin blockchain. And it, um, Biscuit DAO is a data DAO of uh, enthusiastic Corgi owners that want to store their Corgi data onto the blockchain um, to make, uh, to gamify it or, you know, get health data and provide it to veterinarians so they can better understand the landscape of Corgi health. So you can imagine a ZK verified contributor to the DAO uh, uploads their um, Corgi behavior throughout the week into the Filecoin network, and a bunch of them do this. Uh, as they upload that data, they get some kind of token as a reward to incentivize them to add that data. Uh, the DAO can then vote what to do with all of this data. Um, they can vote to train AI and Bacalao and Lilypad. Um, they could vote to use those fees to perpetually store that data for even longer or pay out key contributors to the protocol. And this results in a healthier and happier Corgi ecosystem, and we all want Corgis to be healthy and happy. Right, so many more FVM compatible tools are uh, being developed every day. We have a Docker image that allows you to run Lotus uh, nodes and boost um, locally uh, really quickly in just like a couple of commands in the command line. Oracles are coming live, and uh, Bacalao and Lilypad, again, are great if you want to compute um, data that's actually stored with the storage provider to like train those AI models, for example. And if you want to develop your own data DAO, uh, we have developed this data DAO kit. Um, it is uh, kind of set up with a bunch of preset contracts to help you get started. I highly recommend you check it out. Uh, and all the latest technology will be added to it, such as renewal work uh, actors and others. And I don't think I have time to go through aggregators of proof of inclusion, but this is kind of uh, the future of where we're going next. Uh, it's a way that you can have sub PCIDs in your data so you can search through the data store with storage providers very granularly. And this is just kind of an architecture diagram of renewal as a service actors that can renew your deals, right? And both of these are in various states of development. So if you want to learn more, please check out this QR code, this link tree. Uh, it'll send you to a bunch of FEM resources, um, docs, tutorials. Uh, the kits I mentioned. And with that, uh, I'm running low on time, so thank you. Um, if you see me around the boat, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, come talk to me. I'll answer any of your questions about FEM or software development in general. So uh, thanks for having me.